buys and sells for the week. And Andy had a spicy one for us, so I'm going to go ahead and let him start us off here. All right, well, I'll do the it, – it's it's a interesting buy. Where I'm going to call it a buy, but you don't have to buy this player. You can just go to your waivers, or if you've got your rookie drafts going on, like we said we're going to be talking Dynasty in, in this uh, podcast as well because at the end of the day, Debbie is Dynasty. So this is a, a rookie this season, uh, and it's Siona Vaki, who was a safety for the <laughs> – Utah Utes last season, but he was also used as an offensive player. And when he was drafted in the fourth round by the Detroit Lions, they announced him as a running back. And if you look at his efficiency numbers as a running back last season, it's it's kind of unreal. Like he only had 42 carries, which isn't a tiny sample size. It's a pretty good sample size. His breakaway run rate was is uh, 15%. And he had a breakaway yards per attempt over four, which is pretty much unheard of. I understand that it probably wouldn't have stayed that way had he carried the ball 150 times, but from what we saw, it looked great. And then even more impressive was his receiving numbers. He had 11 catches last season. He only ran 26 routes. He was targeted on 14 of them. So over 50% target percentage on his routes caught 11 balls for 203 yards. So that, comes out to 7.81 yards per uh, route run, which is obviously crazy, unsustainable. But what from what we've seen, like he can he can perform on offense. And he wasn't just taking like dump off screen plays either. He, he ran 25% of his routes out of the slot. So the fact that Detroit took him and announced him as a running back on their team, and, you know, they've got David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs there. Everyone knows that. But – should something happen to one of those in particular, if something happens to Jameer Gibbs, like this is the guy on their roster who can perform that Gibbs role probably better than anyone else that they're going to have. And I think that's kind of why they maybe traded up to take him. So I like Vaki for a while on sleeper. He was just listed as a defensive back, but now he's listed as a running back. I guarantee you he probably wasn't taken in your rookie drafts. He's probably like 1% rostered. You can just, if your rookie draft's still going on, you can take him with your fourth or fifth round pick if you should feel that way, but you don't have to. You can just wait for your rookie draft to be done and pick him up on waivers the next week, which is what I've been doing. So, like I said, it's not really a buy. It's more or less just uh, pick it up because it's free. Yeah, and I'm with you on that because, and honestly, like I hate to say that I agree with everything you said, but I really do. Like he, He's the Jameer Gibbs handcuff that's what he is and if you have the roster spots for it you know if you're in a 24 man league or 24 roster league then you're probably not going to do it but if you're in a 30 plus league with a taxi squad hell yeah i'm adding <laughs> uh i don't even know his freaking name i i i have him I, I literally have him as my 512 in my rookie rankings and i know it starts with an s but i honestly have See, never said his name i had to look up the pronunciation it's siona vaki Siona Vaki. Okay. All right. I got it now. But yeah, so so yeah, like I he's the, the true Jameer Gibbs handcuff, but we already saw Gibbs, you know, miss a little bit of time last year. And uh, you know, I don't think it's insane for any running back to miss time. So it, he could be he could be one of those guys where you draft for a, a fifth round pick or possibly even just add him off of waivers after your rookie draft. And then he was one of those guys that you're able to trade for a third later on or, or something like that. And I mean, you know, whether you use him to like try to score points or you just use him to gain the value with those kind of players, it's like, come on, man, just like you can get a couple of rounds of value. And, and now next year you're able to get like a Marshawn Lloyd or something or a, an equivalent player to a Marshawn Lloyd in the third round because you drafted Vaki in the, in the fifth or, or later, like, yeah, I, I'm all about that. So I like that as a buy. I'm going to go ahead and get into my buy. And it, it's of the same ilk, uh, although not a rookie. It is a running back. And it's Devin Singletary. I feel like people like people are just never going to respect Motor. Like they just don't. They, they refuse to do it. I was all over Singletary being ahead of Damian, uh, Damian Pierce. Yeah. I was about to say Dam Damian Harris, and it did not sound right. <laughs> Damian Pierce last year, 
because Pierce hadn't proven anything. He was not a quality running back. He was just there and he got touches in his, his freshman year or um, his rookie year, I should say. But then Singletary comes over and people are like, so like, well, yeah, he's the backup. He's the, the handcuff, whatever. I'm like, I don't know. I think he can win the job. So I have a ton of Devin Singletary in all of my dynasty leagues. And it wasn't because I loved him as a prospect or anything like that. It's because of the past year or so where people are just like, he's not that good. And I'm like, well, he's not that bad. He might not be amazing. He's not Saquon Barkley or, or, or Bijan Robinson or something like that, but he's good enough. And now he goes over to, to New York and Everyone's like, oh, I got to get Tyron Tracy. I, I, I got to get all these players because Devin Singletary is not that good. All they have to do is beat out Devin Singletary. Damian Pierce couldn't beat out Devin Singletary. You think Tyron Tracy is beating him out? <laughs> like, come on, guys. Um, I'm not saying that he's been amazing. I'm not saying, like, once again, I'm not saying he's, like, the perfect running back or anything like that. But what I am saying is he had three he, – he only had one, two, four, six – games over 60 percent of uh snaps last year for houston and in those six games he had three top 10 uh running back finishes one of them was running back three running back eight and a running back seven finish and that was in the six uh, f- uh six games that he was actually over 60 percent a lot of the games he was under 40 percent of touches or 40 percent 40 percent of snaps i should say and yet he still performed the way that he performed. Like he obviously took that job over a little bit later on in the season, like things like that. But when he got the touches, he performed and he did very well. And I'm not saying that he's going to go out and win you a league or anything like that, but that's the kind of guy that you go get for a third. And then when everyone's freaking out about drafting Tyron Tracy and you get Devin Singletary and all of a sudden you have your flex spot covered you know because with the third round pick that kind of thing so give me give me motor give me devin singletary uh for i would pay a third for him and i think you can get him for a third and i mean you know obviously every league's different every every person's different if somebody has them they love them too that's different but i listen to a lot of podcasts i listen to a, a lot of information and all i hear is Oh man, all, all Tyron Tracy has to do is beat out Devin Singletary over, over, and over again. So it feels like everyone's out on him. And I'm saying, just go get him. Just have him on your team. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, there's if you look at that roster right now, there's also Eric Gray, former Oklahoma running back, who, in my opinion, is better than Tyrone Tracy more than more than likely as well. Like Tyrone Tracy just started playing the running back position last year. I know he did a pretty good job of it, but you know, he is his true position as a wide receiver. Um, so I get, I, you know, I like that people are excited about Tyrone Tracy because I was excited about him a couple of years ago when he went to Purdue and then he kind of did nothing as a wide receiver. And thankfully he did resurrect himself as a running back, but yeah, I mean a third for Singletary, it helped, Hell yeah, I would do that a hundred times, but I I don't know if you can get him for a third. I think you could definitely get him for like a late second, which again, I would probably do that as well, just because you're getting his, if you look at his career, like he's pretty much averaging like 800 rushing yards per year. You know, he's, he's not a, he can catch balls out of the backfield as well. He's going to score you points and that's what, that's the name of the game. So He's not going to be, like you said, he's not going to be the running back one on your team, but he's going to be a, a role player on, you know, especially these deeper fantasy leagues. So I like it. I think uh, he's a guy that's getting looked over. People just probably look at that New York Giants backfield and say, oh, I don't want any part of it. So, you know, get it for cheap if you can. I, I hate when podcasts say like unrealistic, unrealistic things and like act like you, it can just happen wherever. So if you, if I'm wrong about being able to get him for a third, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with being wrong. I'm not willing to pay a second for him because I think, especially if it's a current second, like if your rookie draft hasn't happened or whatever, um, there, there's just too many good players, especially Marshawn Lloyd, which I've talked about on multiple pods uh, for JWB. We've done a lot of like rookie mocks and things like that and, and talked about our picks and like Marshawn Lloyd's going way too late. He's going like late second, early third, a lot of times. 
And if I can get Marshawn Lloyd, like I want nothing to do with Devin Singletary. So like, I don't want to say like I'm giving up a second for Singletary, but there's other ways around this, like you, you, multiple thirds or, you know, whatever. So like, it might be more than a third. And so like, I don't want, I don't want to confuse people. I don't want to do whatever, but I, I don't want to act like, Oh, just go send a late third and in 2025 third, and it'll be a guarantee. But I will say, I think you can get him for maybe more than a third, but less than a second. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. All right. There we go. We, we found the middle ground. So <laughs> uh, why don't you hit us up with your cell then? Uh, we touched on it earlier, and it's uh, a wide receiver who's transferring over to Alabama from Washington following his coach, Kalen DeBoer, and it's Jeremy Bernard. Um, the reason I have him on my cell is because he, he's transferred. This is his second transfer now, so he's going to – I realize he's following his coach. This one's a little different than the first one. But he's gone through three different teams. Uh, he's never really produced too much. He was a wide receiver four last year on that Washington team. And he's going to a team which is probably going to be a run first offense with Jalen Milrow, who's going to run for 800 yards. Probably we already talked about Jam Miller and Justice Haynes, who are going to be a dynamic running back duo. And, you know, he kind of was the slot guy when he did come in. And I don't know if that's just because he was filling in in that slot role because of the injuries that they had. But when you look at the, Alabama's depth chart right now like I think Kendrick Law might be a better slot receiver than Jeremy Bernard and Jeremy Bernard as of last month in C2C ADP is going 38 overall like that's not even wide receiver 38 so pretty early in drafts just because he's in that DeBoer offense and people just kind of expect him to replicate what was going on at at Washington, which I don't think is necessarily what's going to happen there. It's a completely different team, completely different skill sets. I just don't think that Jeremy Bernard is going to be like this elite wide receiver all of the sudden, just because he's going to be starting in this offense with Keelan DeBoer, because Alabama is not Washington from a season ago. It's still Alabama. So, you know, best case scenario, maybe he ends up with a season like Jermaine Burton. Uh, which wasn't a bad season, but at the end of the day, it wasn't like a great season either. You know, Jermaine Burton ended up getting what, like late day th two capital, which would be awesome. But Jermaine Burton's also a guy who led Alabama and Georgia in receiving at one point or another in his career. And I don't think anyone's, you know, projecting that for Jeremy Bernard right now. Yeah, it's it's tough with Bernard because he was behind a bunch of studs, you know, and so it's it's really difficult to say was was he good? Did he even have a chance to be good? You know, because even if you don't assume that Robadunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillan are all going to hit in the NFL, they were all drafted by the NFL. They all got decent draft capital at the very least, and obviously Robadunze got amazing draft capital. Um, and, and Jalen Polk got pretty good draft capital. So I, I would say he didn't necessarily get a fair shot. <laughs> so it, it's hard to, it, it's hard to say that he's bad or anything like that. I was actually, um, not too long ago, I was, I was disparaging Bernard and then I forgot that I was not giving him his teammate score. And it's like probably one of the few players that like truly, truly needs a teammate score added into his profile because of what he was dealing with. And I was like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe that's why he wasn't producing because he was dealing with all this other stuff. So uh, he's kind of in that, like not obviously not the same situation at all, but he's kind of in that like Lenore Sellers kind of talk that we we're talking about before. Where I'm like, I just have no idea. You know, I, I don't want to say he's good. I don't want to say he's bad. I'm going to say I have no idea. He is, I will say that he's being drafted too highly um, because even with adding in the teammate score, if you're saying he was being drafted 38th overall, he's my wide receiver 29 right now. So 38th overall, I'm assuming that there's uh, more than nine uh quarterbacks and running backs that are being drafted and so i'm going to go ahead and assume that i am lower than consensus right now on jeremy bernard 
Uh, but you know, I it's just it's so tough, and, and players in this range are going to be difficult to decipher. Like, are they? Do they have a shot? Do they not like that kind of thing? So the only thing we can say for Bernard is he is a true junior. And at least he has that going for him because there's a lot of players in this range that are fifth year players and stuff like that, where I'm like, at least Bernard has that shot where, okay, now he gets his chance at Bama and he skyrockets, but I don't want to bet on it. Yeah, no. And and I, I get that too, because there's a good, there's a chance that he does end up, you know, hitting and doing really well. But like you said, it's not something we want to bet on. And this is, you know, if you it's if you look at the ADP, his average ADP is 95. So that goes back to like February or January when they started doing their their mock drafts for C2C. He's just been climbing up the boards because of the transfer to Alabama and being attached to Kalen DeBoer and probably we think is going to be one of the three starting wide receivers in that, on that team. But it's a lot of projection, like you said. So I just, there's always somebody that I would probably prefer over him, especially now that it seems like he's getting pumped up way into like the fourth round of startups. Yeah. And, and the efficiency numbers are just not there. So, like, even beyond, like, if, you know, obviously it's, it's not perfect, but you take away what everyone else did and just look at what he did on a, per touch basis and it's not that exciting he is a low a dot player um which might be tough because he was once again the fourth option that kind of thing so maybe he would be a higher a dot player on a different team so we'll take that away but the ppr points per touch the yards per team pass attempt like that kind of stuff is just not there and so i'm, I'm more willing to be out than i am in so i i, I appreciate it as a sell and that is going to bring us to uh, another sell, but it, this is one that we'll probably disagree on a little bit more because my sell is going to be Tez Johnson. And it's not really that I like absolutely hate the player or anything like that, but I feel like for a fifth year player, he's just getting a little too much hype right now. Like people are trying to almost like push him. I'm not saying you, but I've heard other people pushing him ahead of, uh of evan stewart and at least for cff purposes for you know like this year like that kind of thing and and I mean, obviously you were talking about that as well but i, I just i don't i really struggle with that like it, evan stewart is a better wide receiver or at least, at least a better recruit obviously but i mean like he's shown more than um than tez johnson throughout his two years of college and Tez Johnson's had four and yet, you know, like now all of a sudden we're going to say, Oh yeah, he's going to take over. He's going to do this. Well, obviously Evan Stewart was not there. Now we have to figure out, do you like Troy Franklin or not? Do you think he's good or not? I think that he's better than a lot of people will give him credit for. I think he's better than the fourth round draft capital that he got. So I will say that I, I like Troy Franklin, but, uh, I also know that Tez Johnson was dealing with the quarterback that liked to dump it off all the time. Like, and I'm not saying that Dylan Gabriel won't do it. I'm saying that Dylan Gabriel has more ability to push the ball down the field than Bo Nix did. And so we can get more, more passes down the field for an actual like football player like Evan Stewart. Then we're just going to get dinks and dunks to Tez Johnson. Um, I just, I don't know. He's he's not he's not a highly rated player for Debbie Beth, and I people are like pushing him up, pushing him up, and talking about oh he's my he's he's in my top ten for Debbie wide receivers and stuff like that. And like I, yeah, I, I can't do it, guys. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because if you look at the ADP, Tez Johnson is actually getting drafted higher as a Debbie recruit or a Debbie prospect than he is as a C two C prospect. I think it should be the other way around because I do think that Dylan Gabriel is going to target that slot receiver more so than take those shots downfield. Yeah, he he could, he had that t- over 10 yards a dot with Oklahoma, but if you look at what his receivers were actually doing, it was 84 catches to Drake Stoops, whose a dot was um, 7.6, which is right around what Tez Johnson's at as well. And then after that, you know, you've got 
uh, Nick Anderson, who, you know, had 38 catches or Jaleel Farouk who had 45 catches. So it seems like the, the wide receiver that Gabriel favors is that uh, underneath slot guy, which would be what Tez Johnson is. And he has, it's not like he's been a zero his entire career. Like his, his, his sophomore year, he had 700 yards. His junior year, he had 800 yards. And then last year, he obviously had a big season with 1,100 yards. So he's been around for a while. He's just not a name that people have just really been talking about or paying attention because he's always been kind of behind that Troy Franklin. So, um, yeah, I don't know if he's a Devi guy right now just because he is a, a fifth-year dude, but and he is just sort of a slot receiver. There's not much exciting about him. Um, but you know, where he's at right now in C2C, I think he's like wide receiver 27 ish, 25. Um, I would probably take him just based on the idea that maybe he is like a top five scorer in college this season, this season. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, he's like in my wide receiver sixties. I just not saying like, I hate him. And I've, I have learned that like with Ricky Pearsall, like people, people were just like dismissing me whenever I mentioned his name in the past and everything. And I'm like, no, no, but like he's showing up now. He was much higher than wide receiver 60, but like he was showing up in Debbie Beth. And I'm like, Oh, Ricky Pearsall. And people are like, no, 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 he's, he sucks. And then obviously he went on to, to, to be pretty damn good and get drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. I'm not saying that's always going to happen. I'm not saying that I even know exactly what it was that made it work because there's, you know, there's other players that just don't hit like that. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to not just dismiss players that are at least in the top, like 100 anymore, where I used to be like, Oh, if you were like 80, I'm like, Oh, you're garbage, you know, whatever. And I'm like, he could be something, you know, like that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm saying that Tez Johnson could be something. I'm also saying I don't believe he's something. Yeah, I I mean, I like him. I like him. I, he's, a, he's a good slot guy, but, you know, that's that's about it. There's not much more to be said about him. It, you know, I, I, I've been talking about yards per route run a lot. He's had three seasons above 2.2 yards per route run, and the last two seasons was over 3.4 yards per route run, and for his career is 2.9. So – Pretty efficient receiver, um, but like you said, he's he's not that exciting. Unless like a down the field threat, 